Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Alcon, along with Dennis Dick, and we have Kevin McPartland on the line. He's Principal of Market Structure and Technology at Greenwich Associates. Kevin, how are you doing this morning? Great. Good morning. How are you? We're doing good. We're doing good. Uh, some good action in the S&Ps here, but uh, Dennis is going to pepper you with a few questions about market structure. Yeah, we'll dump, you know jump into the market structure here in a second, but just want to get an overall feel here for you because um, I've been noticing the last few days been a lot of institutional closing orders here, and I'm just wondering what you're seeing from your front. Are you noticing at the institutions they're starting to get a little more nervous here, or do you? Um, I don't know if you can talk about any of this stuff or not, but what are you seeing at your firm there from you know an institutional perspective? Um, first of all, just with the overall market. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this is going is still going back to what we can't stop talking about, right? Is uh, central bank interest rate policy, right? And, it, yeah. and in the old days, uh, we wouldn't talk so much about interest rates when we were talking about the stock market, but today that seems to be all anybody can talk about, no matter what you're trading. So we've seen, uh, you know, a good jump in volatility on the rate side. Uh, the VIX doesn't seem to be budging, but uh, but you know, on in, on the interest rate side, we've seen. Uh, 10-year Treasury yields jumped pretty dramatically over the last couple of days and couple of weeks. And I think that's really starting to make people wonder, you know, is the Fed going to move faster? And, and when, you know, when is that, uh, that interest rate rise finally going to come? Not to mention all of the stuff that's going on in Europe, which is a whole, uh, maybe a whole other uh, topic for a whole other show. But it's really just kind of making the world wonder sort of what's next and, and, and putting some uncertainty into the market, which I think is probably what's causing some of the, uh, the movement in the equity market. So, Kevin, um, I was actually just wanted to talk to you briefly about this SEC Equity Market Structure Advisory Committee. They formed this committee back in January. Got some very interesting people on this committee. Brad Katsuyama's on it from IEX. Ted Kaufman, former senator, is on it. Joe McCain, who used to be with the NYSE, who's now with Barclays, is on this. Uh, you've got... Uh, Eric Knoll, Joe Ratterman from BATS, Gary Stone from Bloomberg Tradebook, some big names on this committee. And this committee is uh, setting up to advise the SEC on various uh, market structure issues. First of all, what are your thoughts of the committee? And then maybe we could jump into their meeting that they had on May 13th. Yeah, you know what? I think what's one good thing that's really come out of the, the, the crisis in 2008 is we've seen the SEC and a number of other agencies um, really start to tap the industry a lot more than they had in the past to get them around the table to ask them the tougher questions, to really get a better feel for how these markets function. I think this is a great um, example of that. And, and you can see even just from the names that you read, right, you have, you have folks on, on both sides of most of the issues there and maybe a few neutral parties. I think they have a couple of academics thrown in there as well. So you've got the, you know, we, we hate to try to put, you know, folks in sort of pro-HFT and anti-HFT camps, but in some cases maybe that's the easiest way to segment them. But, um, you know, that committee certainly got a little bit of both of that with very diverse background so you know so hopefully that'll that'll result in a balanced set of feedback the sec takes in as they work through some of these issues and potential new rules what are your thoughts on the meeting that they had on may 13th they were discussing sec rule 611 which is the order protection rule or you could call it the trade through rule and that rule was designed to basically protect the top of the book um what are your thoughts here first of all on you know the discussion that happened um from that meeting and or did you have a chance to watch the the advisory committee meeting first of all and secondly what were your thoughts on their discussion on sec rule 611 yeah, I mean, I think people are starting to wonder if it's if it's a little bit um, it's a little bit out of date at this stage, right? And if uh, if it's mm. time for some changes there, um, the market's moving a whole lot faster than it was when all of these rules were put in place. That's an understatement, right? So, um, you know, do we really need to sort of protect the top of book when um, you know when the markets are moving so quickly, and, and maybe the top of book isn't the top of book by the time you even get there? Yeah. Uh, so I, I right. So I think that I think that you know it, it's time. It's certainly time for a revisit, if not a time for a complete revamp. Um, of how that rule works. And, and you know, and you have, I, th I think we could all agree that we have much more uh, sophisticated investors with much more sophisticated tools, um, not to mention, especially for the large, uh, the large institutional asset managers, you know, they've got a responsibility to their investors to be sure they're finding the best price. So I'm not sure if you need to dictate exactly what that means. Uh, you know, the market participants, I, I think, have enough uh, sort of impetus on their own to make sure that they're going out and, and getting that best price. So, uh, yeah, it, it seems like it is getting, it, it, it's a rule that needs uh, revisiting, no question. 
it was interesting, the conversation, and this was a six or seven hour meeting there, and it kept going, and they were talking about the trade through and talking about SEC Rule 611, but the conversation kept drifting into a different area, and it kept drifting into off-exchange trading. Um, multiple, I know NYSE uh, had brought up, there was, a, there was a panelist with the NYSE on that panel, I believe it was... Um, I'm trying to, Tom Farley from the NYSC, and he was really talking about off exchange trading a lot. And a lot of the other uh, panelists and a lot of the other uh, people who came on afterwards were very concerned with uh, the rise in off exchange trading. Is that something you guys are concerned with over there, Greenwich? No, well, I mean, so the way that it's developed over years, in my opinion, is I think it's gone a little far afield from what it was originally intended to. Uh, to help with, right? So, you know, as the average order size executed on exchanges has continued to decline over the last decade or more, um, it's gotten harder and harder for large institutions to get those big orders done. And as I've pointed out several times with you guys in the past, you know, they're large institutions, sure, but really what they're doing is investing our money. So you want them, the reason why you put your money with a big asset manager in a lot of ways is the economies of scale that they get when they're going out to the market and, and investing for you. So if, you know, if you have a, you know, a hundred thousand share order that you need to execute, it could take all day to do that with algorithms at 200 shares a clip. Uh, if you could go into a sort of an off exchange venue that helps you to find a natural buyer for your order or, or you know, or a, uh, you know, or a natural seller, if you're looking to buy, you can get that block uh, presumably at a better price and get it done a lot quicker. And I, in my head, that's what you know, sort of the off exchange venues were originally intended to to help. And I guess if there's any other uh, any other bit to that, it's for the the, the dealer owned um, crossing networks. That was then to add some efficiency for their clients, right? If they if they have a natural other side of the trade. Um, you know, within their own, uh, within that, within that broker dealer, then why not match that buyer and seller off, um, save everybody a little bit of money and exchange fees and make that process more efficient. So, so to me, those were the, those were, that's where this all came from. And it seems that we've gone a long way, um, from those original goals, uh, into a place where, yeah, maybe it's a little, it's a little too, it's gone a little too far and it's gone a little far afield. And I, to me, that's the only concern. It's, some ways you can get a little distracted listening to, you know, the heads of the major exchanges talk about why off exchange trading is bad. Yeah, clearly, I mean, right? They're, they're talking their books. Right, right. Yeah, and that's a consideration, obviously, as well. And I think the SEC considers that too. I mean, the exchanges obviously want all the business on exchange because they're in the business of that. Um, my concern, just though, is you know we've seen this rise, and just you know for our listeners who don't follow the market structure that closely, so off exchange trading has risen significantly here in the last. And what we mean by off exchange trading is trades occurring not on uh, on one of the eleven stock exchanges, actually occurring off exchange, and we've seen this rise go from. 10, 15, 20 percent in 2009, and lately it's been 35 to 40 percent. So basically, over the course of the last five or six years, really off exchange, the, their, their market share has increased over almost 20 percent, which is substantial here. And at a certain point in time, because the concern is off exchange trading doesn't have that pre trade transparency. That's always been my concern, where obviously on exchange, you can see the prices ahead of time. Off exchange trading is kind of just using the exchanges to price the orders. And if all the orders flow starts to go off exchange, well, where does, what is it, where does the order pricing go? And does that impact price discovery? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and that's the biggest concern, right? If it went too far one direction, you wouldn't have prices in the first place, and and um, you know you could see where the exchanges could get a uh, could, could get a bit annoyed, quite frankly, because their pricing is being used to to match orders yeah. uh, to match orders elsewhere. That's a bit frustrating, but you know from an investor's point of view, and even for the dealer's perspective, um, and we see this in other markets, right, where there's either some uncertainty or complexity, sort of in the you know in the core space. Uh, where they should be executing, whether it be on an exchange or some other registered venue, they say, you know what, this is more trouble than it's worth. We're just going to go over here, make a phone call, or or use this this uh, sort of offline matching system, if you will, to get this order done because it's just more efficient and cheap for us. So I think it's you know it's less about trying to um, stop the the off exchange trading and trying to you know fix the market structure for the on exchange trading to make it more economically uh, viable and, and, you know, provide some incentive to both the buyers and the sellers. Um, yeah. To, to get back and sort of trade on the market the way that, he, that the market was originally intended. Kevin, uh, Greenwich Associates has put out a couple reports lately, and I'd just like to touch on those. Uh, the first one, uh, the drive toward alpha generation continues. Tell us about the study and uh, what your conclusions were. 
Yeah, so so transaction cost analysis, the total cost analysis, um, is technology that's being used by most institutional investors at this stage, right? So uh, for the most part, post trade, they'll look at you know they'll look at the executions they've received. Um, they'll compare those executions across different brokers for different orders, and they'll use that to make sure that they really are getting you know the best price and the best executions all in, including exchange fees and broker fees, um, understanding what venues the order went to. So obviously, it's gotten some more and more sophisticated. I think it's about 90% of investors told us they use this in some way, shape, or form. Um, but as I pointed out, it's always been post-trade. So one of the things we're starting to see is folks trying to figure out how to use that same technology to help uh, make them deci- make decisions before the trade is done. So can we predict you know, where this order might get executed, which brokers tend to get us the best prices, um, you know, where are exchange fees lower, um, you know, what impact will this have on the market based on today's liquidity and, and looking back historically. Um, and it's been, it's, been a, it's been a sort of a slow road to get there because that, that, you know, rather than um, sort of doing some post-trade analysis on what actually happened, you're doing some analysis on what you think might happen. So you get in the, you know, a little bit in the realm of sort of artificial intelligence, looking into the crystal ball um, to help make decisions. Um, but, you know, as we, as we keep talking about that, as these markets get more and more complicated, um, you know, injecting some, you know, sort of more computer intelligence to aid the decisions that are made by the trader and all that sort of experience that they've built up in their head over time uh, is a good thing. And we're starting to see more and more focus and adoption of technology like that. I mean, I, I know I'm probably just beating a dead horse with this, but, you know, now that you have that, you know, the pennies and the sub pennies for an institution to get 100,000 shares off, I mean, how many different prices yeah well that each transaction cost for each hundred shares or 200 shares yeah that's come down but i just can't imagine what the clearing is like you know for getting these average prices especially if you're doing things for managed accounts and everything i mean wouldn't you know transaction costs have come down but now these institutions to move big orders have to have so many different prices and so many different trades it's probably really not that much cheaper. Do you think that, uh, you know, there's any chance of, you know, going back to nickels or something like that, or pennies here to stay? Nah, nah, I can't imagine that we would. But, but yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you on the complexity side. It's gotten, a, it's gotten too far, taken us a little beyond, I think, what the intention was. Right? Technology should add efficiency to a process. Um, and I think there are obviously cases here where we've, like we, like you said, we've seen it go um, a little bit too far. Certainly, the market is more efficient than it was, right? It doesn't take multiple phone calls and and uh, a couple of minutes to get an order done. You can obviously do that a couple of microseconds again, as we've talked about, um, you know, quite a number of times. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's taking really, you know, with, with the market trading between sophisticated computers, it's taking other sophisticated computers to understand. Um, you know, what those executions were and what they looked like and what your total cost was. Um, but no, I, I think in the end, despite all of that, yeah, I, I mean, I do, the costs are still down. Um, it's just a little harder to quantify that. Um, and we see this going on in other markets that are going through a, a, you know, a real technology evolution now, whether it be, you know, corporate bonds or FX, you know, where they're getting more and more electronic and the markets are fragmenting. And, you know, a lot of the conversations amongst those market participants are, you know, let's look at what happened in equities. Let's figure out what was good there and use that technology. But let's also figure out where what didn't really work in equities and make sure that we don't end up in the same place in these other asset classes. Okay. And uh, your other report, business as usual, eyeing fundamental change in payment for research. And, you know, we talk a lot about the ratings and the ratings changes and the institutional clients. Uh, tell us about the report and your conclusions. Yeah, so this is a whole other interesting area that we've been looking at from a market structure perspective. The rules uh, in Europe that have been proposed and are sort of slowly working their way towards implementation that are known uh, as MIFID II. And one of the big pieces in that uh, in that rule set uh, is that the, the European regulators want uh, investors to be paying separate hard dollars for research separate from what they're paying for execution, right? Whereas today, if you're paying a couple of basis points for the execution, that's including sort of these added services, if you will, from the dealers, whether that be corporate access or, or access to research, access to their expert analysts. Um, so on one hand, it sounds like that makes sense. Let's, you know, let's sort of decide what execution costs and pay for that. Let's decide what research costs and pay for that. 
you know, however, when you really start to think about it and dig into it, it's hard to put a value on that research that the, the brokers are providing because it's not just a string of reports. Like I said, it's sort of access. It's market color. It's knowing which analyst to talk to. And, you know, the value of one written research report to one asset manager is going to be very different than what it might be to another asset manager. So, so putting a hard dollar value on that is pretty complicated. Um, and, you know, I guess to add on to that, then the, the technology and the cost to even – to sort of figure out how to manage those, those that, that what would be a fundamental change in how these markets are priced um, is pretty complicated. And our conclusion was that we don't we feel like this is the regulators looking for a you know looking for a problem for their solution. We don't really see this as a um, you know as a fundamental issue with the way the market works. The asset managers, the pension funds, they they, they don't seem terribly upset about the way things are today either. Um, so I'm not sure this is, you know, this is the, I'm not sure this is the right direction, but it's certainly a, a pretty sort of groundbreaking, you know, piece of, uh, regulation, uh, that we're going to keep a close eye on. Kevin McPartlane, principal of market structure and technology at Greenwich Associates, uh, talking market structure, commissions, transaction costs at Wall Street Analyst. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Great interview. We hope to have you back on again soon. Great talking with you guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Kevin.